do you plan your birding year or do you just take it as it happens? Normally, I do the latter, but this year I'm being a little more intentional about my birding plans, driven by the desire to see more species, especially in my local area. I'd love to see if I can overtake my last year's total of 166 species. Yes, I think I've become a lister. Welcome to the Casual Birder podcast. I'm Susie Buttress. As a casual birder, I take pleasure in watching the wild birds around me, wherever I am. In my show, I share the joy of birding. I tell you about the birds I've seen, speak with experts and enthusiasts, go on bird outings, and I share stories from birders around the world. In my last full episode, I looked back at the birds I saw in 2021 and shared my favourite birding moments, such as the low flyby of a magnificent white-tailed eagle on Isla, off the west coast of Scotland. We also heard from naturalist and wildlife presenter Mike Dilger. While I was standing with him on the seabed of the Moray Firth, he gave me some great tips for identifying some of the wildfowl and waterbirds around us. Those tips have helped me out in my birding since then, and they may help you. Do take a listen. My experience with keeping checklists on eBird last year has encouraged me to set myself a personal challenge. How many bird species can I see this year? I know some people have a target, like the 200 bird year challenge. I won't officially set that as my challenge because I think that'll take me out of my casual birding comfort zone and put too much pressure on my birding. But it would be interesting to see if I can pass last year's total of 166 species. What I especially would like to do is increase the number of species that I've identified in my region. For my favourite style of birding, I don't just want to tick birds off a list. I want to really get to know them. I want to take time to observe their behaviours their plumage and their songs or calls. And so my personal goal will be to see how many birds I can recognise or discover during the year through visiting a variety of locations. I'll be keeping track via my eBird checklists, which will produce a year list, trip lists, a garden list and even an office window list, birds seen from my desk while working. In fact, I've recently fixed a window feeder to my upstairs office window and I'll be keeping a list in my notebook of the birds that visit that too. So far, that's a grand total of one, a blue tit. But I'm hopeful more will visit as they get to know the feeder is there. One of the things I'm doing this year is taking part in the local Big Year Challenge. Launched by Bird Guides, this challenge helps you appreciate and enjoy the birds in your local area by encouraging you to pick a radius up to 10 kilometres from wherever you live and to look for birds at locations within that. The rules of the challenge are fairly flexible. You can make it as strict or as relaxed as you like. Some people will only bird that radius and nowhere else, while others will keep separate lists of their local birding. And that's what I'm doing. Sean Morris inspired me to take part. He's doing an eight kilometre radius challenge, which takes in the whole of the Isle of Rum in Scotland, where he lives. I'll do a 10 kilometre radius, which will include my walkable patches and the sites I went to last year, such as the Vine and Black Dam Ponds. I'm currently at 46 species for my local list, and I'm excited to discover the birds locally that I might not have realised were there. I know that all of this talk of lists might sound a bit too much, but it's just a way of keeping aware of all the different species I've seen. I asked in the podcast's Facebook group how everyone's year list was coming on, if they kept one, and I got a wide range of totals. Christopher, at 61 species, said that he didn't think of bird watching as a competition, but lists are a good way of realising how many species you actually see. I agree with this. I'm only challenging myself to see if I surpass last year's total. Well, and having a gentle competition with my husband. Natasha mentioned that a more experienced birding friend of hers has shared their lists, and Natasha said it alerts her to the possibilities that she might see. Andrew has been keeping lists for five years and finds it fascinating comparing the years, seeing when different species are first or last seen. He said he tried for a 200 year once, but the chasing around was quite stressful and took the fun out of it, and I can empathise with that point. 
Andrew also pointed out that the numbers of species people see can so often be a product of where you are and the habitats nearby, a point that was exemplified by Paul in California, who was already up to 186 at the time the thread was active. I recently picked up a guide to the birds of Hampshire, a checklist created by Alan Cox, John Clark and John Eyre. It details which birds can commonly be found and when, and also lists the less commonly found species for our county. I'm going to enjoy looking through that to see what birds I think are reasonable possibles for my birding year ahead. Maybe there'll be a checklist for your county too. If you'd like to help support the show's production, you can add to our tip jar by buying me a virtual coffee at ko-fi.com. Episode transcriptions are an important aid to accessibility and also help people find the show from web searches. I use an automated system to produce the first draft transcripts, but they require further refinement from a human to get an accurate transcript, including the proper formatting. Three virtual coffees would pay for one month's automated transcription. Five virtual coffees are required for each finalised transcription by a human. My current goal is £200, which will buy six months of automated transcription and 10 completed episodes. We're now at 21% of the £200 goal, And thanks so much to Sean, Sarah G, Annika and Tim for buying me virtual coffees since the last episode. All your support, financial or otherwise, is very much appreciated. Thinking about my year list so far, we're in mid-February and I've seen 80 species, which is a massive increase on this time last year. Although part of that will be due to the pandemic restrictions in early 2021. And as I wasn't really keeping a year list previous to that, quite possibly this is my best start to a year ever, if we don't count the year I was in Australia for the new year. This has been helped by visits to my local patch, a circular walk that takes in Beggarwood Park in Basingstoke, where I live, the Vine, a stately home built in Tudor times, about eight kilometres away, which is open to the public, Farlington Marshes on the coast near Portsmouth in Hampshire, Titchfield Haven, a new favourite reserve for me, which is on the coast between Southampton and Portsmouth. Blashford Lakes, near Ringwood, also in Hampshire. A trip to Hanningfield Reservoir in Essex, when I recently visited my parents. And of course my garden, which gave me my first 12 species of the year, including blackbird, blue tit, robin and rook. My rook friend, Rooksy, has started visiting more regularly again, and bringing its pals along too. A bit more about the sites I visited in January. My first visit of the new year was to the Vine. I've never actually been in the house, but I love walking in the grounds and the nearby wood. There's a range of different habitats with a walled garden, a lake, a wetland area with an observation hide and a small woodland. And to help with comfort breaks, there's a great cafe and toilets. Birds I'm likely to see there are woodland species such as tree creeper, nuthatch and great spotted woodpecker and garden favourites like European robin and Eurasian blackbird. I've seen missile and song thrush there on occasion and once a lesser spotted woodpecker, my only ever sighting. The hide provides views of, depending on the time of year, geese, various duck species and waders such as northern lapwings. There's often grey heron and sometimes little egret. As you can tell, there are plenty of species there to keep me occupied during my slow walks around the grounds. Going there at the beginning of January helped me add 21 species to my year list, including the tiny goldcrest, kestrel and several water birds such as northern shoveler, teal, gadwall and grey lag goose. In fact, one of the geese was leucistic, its plumage lacking in dark pigment so that it appeared much whiter than the other grey legs, so that was really interesting to see. During January, we also made a visit to Farlington Marshes. We stopped at a car park this time overlooking Langstone Harbour before we walked around Farlington Marshes Reserve. Depending on the state of the tide, the wading birds can be a long way out from the reserve, making them difficult to see without a scope. The stop at Langstone Harbour brought us much closer to some of the species we were able to see dunlin and sanderling out on the sandbanks, curlews, redshanks, a couple of red-breasted megansas and plenty of gulls. 
At Farlington Marshes, there are grazing fields and shrubs to explore as well. And according to the Hampshire and Isle of Wight Wildlife Trust's website, short-eared owls, wrynecks and windchats are regularly spotted depending on the season. When we were there during the first half of January, we saw several goose species, including a lone barnacle goose that was hanging out with the Canada geese and what looked like a domestic goose. I added 22 species to my year list on the trip to Farlington, including grey plover, northern pintail, common gull and common ringed plover. As the sun was starting to set, I got chatting to another birder, Andrew and his family, who told me about Titchfield Haven, somewhere I'd heard of but didn't really know much about. As it was a similar distance from home as Farlington Marshes, I added it to my list of local reserves for future visits. It turned out to be a very good tip from Andrew, so my thanks to him, and even more thanks as he now listens to the show and has joined our Facebook group. Beggarwood Park is on my local patch, and there's a walk that takes in playing fields, thin lines of woodland in between residential areas, and Beggarwood Park itself, which is a mix of open grass and copses. I recently discovered that there's a footpath through the trees that line one side of the park, with gardens beyond. If they have feeders, this might attract birds, making them a bit easier to see. It was a glorious day when I took my walk in mid-January, and I went live on Facebook to show the Facebook group some of the birds I was seeing. I added five species to my year list that day, including woodland birds, great-spotted woodpecker, bullfinch and nuthatch. At the end of January, I took a weekend visit to my parents in Essex, and we went to Hanningfield Reservoir. It must be over 25 years since I was last there, and I was delighted to find that there are now hides at various points around the reservoir, which make it a bit more comfortable to sit and watch the birds. It was a very pleasant day and lovely to be out with my parents. I chatted to a few other birders as we walked around and learned that a red-breasted goose had been seen in the company of some grey lags nearby. Red-breasted geese are a rare winter visitor. They breed in the Siberian tundra and usually winter around the coast of the Caspian and Black Seas. I looked for it but had no luck. Side note, I later learned that one had been seen in Southwoodham Ferrers, which is where my parents live, along with a black brant goose, which is also a rare visitor from America. So that's three times I've missed seeing a red-breasted goose in the last few months, with the one that was on Isla when we were there, the one that had been seen at Hanningfield, and one that was seen right where I was staying for the weekend, in Southwoodham Ferrers. The day at Hanningfield brought me five more species for my year list, including Goldeneye and Goosander. As I'd only learned those species when we were in Scotland last November, I was very pleased with myself for spotting them, though I did seek confirmation of my photo from the Facebook group, just to be sure. At the end of January, we went to Titchfield Haven. Unfortunately, we started out late, so didn't get there until midday. Next time, we'll definitely aim to get there sooner. I've decided that this is my favourite birding spot for a day trip. It probably helped that it was a lovely sunny day. The reserve encompasses both sides of the River Meon and is across the road from where it joins the Solent. Oh, and as we arrived at Titchfield Haven, we saw a wonderful sight, uh, a group of about 15 to 20 turnstones all sitting on a harbour wall in bright sunlight. It would have been a beautiful photograph, but we were in the line of traffic and couldn't stop. But I've been told that they're often there, so I'm hoping to go back and see them again. We parked and looked out at the sea first, noting a raft of Brent geese in the mid-distance, along with some great crested grebes. We got the scope out, a rare event, to look for birds further out on the water. I don't often get my scope out because while I might take it with me on trips, It's quite bulky to carry around with all my other equipment and it needs a dedicated tripod. But when I know we're going to be looking for birds out on the water or maybe birds at a reserve where I don't have to walk too far with the scope, then I will take it. As the tide was starting to go out, we waited to see if any waders would turn up to feed on the newly uncovered sand, which they did. Oyster catchers, dunlin, turnstones and sandling were feeding alongside a little egret and herring gulls. We headed down to the visitor centre to pay for entry to the reserve and stopped to have a cup of coffee and piece of cake in the tea garden, noting the dunnock, robin and blue tits in the trees above us. After trying out the cottage hide, which looks out onto some feeders and would be great for children to introduce them to the birds, we headed back along the road to get to the entrance to the western side of the reserve. 
At the gate, I stopped to speak to Rosie and Mark, two birders who were just leaving the reserve. Mark gave me some great tips about the snipe and jack snipe they'd seen at one of the hides. It turned out that Rosie had been an RSPB volunteer in Sherwood Forest and knew some of my hoped-for future guests. It was lovely speaking to them both. John had continued on into the reserve and I went to join him in the first hide. The afternoon lighting was gorgeous and the birds were relatively close by, so I managed to get some lovely photos and videos. Thanks to Mark's tips, I did indeed see the snipe, but the jack snipe eluded us. Oh well, there's always next time. While the beach had been very busy with people out enjoying the Sunday afternoon sunshine, the reserve itself was lovely and quiet, and there was plenty of opportunity to watch and listen to the birds. During my observations, I learned that shell duck have very coarse calls, as one pair were aggressively warning off a couple of others. I added six species to my year list, including black-tailed godwit and avocet, and I got some really nice views of the black-tailed godwit, and was able to see, as Mike had mentioned last episode, that they do indeed have very soft colouring on their backs, and when they fly, have very clear white markings in the wings, and the black tail is obvious. So it was nice to put that information to use. As we were leaving the reserve, well, being kindly kicked out by the warden, Doug, we chatted to him about the wooden platforms I'd seen amongst the reeds. He said they were grit tables for the bearded tits they have there, and gave us some great tips about when to see them and the marsh harriers that roost on the reserve. Thanks, Doug. As a cold wind had picked up, we sat in our car and watched the sunset while eating the sandwiches I had made for lunch, but we hadn't got round to eating. Thanks again to Andrew at Farlington for mentioning Titchfield Haven. I can't wait to go back. The most recent trip I made was to Blashford Lakes near Ringwood, Hampshire last weekend. We only had an afternoon there, but we still managed to see 30 species, including Gusanda and Western Marsh Harrier. And I was able to add Common Potchard and Great White Egret to my year list. I was quite surprised to see the Great White Egret as it flew past. I saw my first UK one on the last day of 2021, and then, less than two months later, I see my second. That day was a bit of a disaster on a personal front. I was trying to finish some video editing in the morning, which took longer than expected, doesn't it always? So we were rushing to get out before it got too late. As a result, I forgot to take my coat, though luckily I did have a fleece and a second outer layer to wear. It was mostly a mild afternoon, but got colder towards sunset when the wind picked up. It's worth staying until sunset at Blashford Lakes, as you can see lots of gulls coming into roost, and sometimes a starling murmuration from near the turn hide. They lock the car park, so you have to make sure you're parked outside of the gated area, although you can stay inside on foot. The second disaster was that I tripped as I was climbing through the closed car park gate, fell onto my camera and grazed my knee and shin. Luckily, the only thing that broke was my lens hood, which was easily replaced. The camera survived. I found out afterwards that there's a path to follow for when the gates are closed, which I shall certainly remember for next time. A very big thanks to all who've shared the Casual Birder podcast on social media, especially if you've written a review or said why you enjoy the show. It really does help others to find the podcast. On an Instagram post about her visit to Titchfield Haven, at Rambling Rosie Wild said, We also stumbled across the lovely at Casual Birder podcast and had a wonderful chat. Her podcast is so warm and welcoming to birding amateurs like myself, and I highly recommend you all give it a listen. It was lovely to meet you, Rosie, and thank you so much for sharing your kind words on your account. And on Twitter, Samuel Griffiths, at Samuel P. Griff, said, I'm a late, very late, comer to at Casual Birder Pod, but definitely a new fave, and coincidentally listened to number 47 on my way into London today with at Song by Song Pod's visit to Regent's Park. Samuel said that he was staying near Regent's Park and managed to find 23 species in the hour before dark. Thanks so much, Samuel, and welcome aboard. Corvid Crazy Chap, at Shepherd Wells on Twitter, said, So yesterday and today I caught up with the latest podcast episodes of at UK Wildlife Pod and at Casual Birder Pod, both great as usual, but especially as I was name mentioned in both as long-time listener and contributor. Thanks, guys. And then a few days later, he gave us another shout out when he was mentioned on the Wildlife Garden podcast. 
Mel, you're becoming a professional at this. But seriously, thank you for engaging with the podcast you listen to and for being so helpful and generous with your birding knowledge. If you share the show on social media, please do tag me. And thank you to everyone who spreads the word. I recently moved my home office up into a bedroom at the front of the house in order for my husband and I to work in isolation and not get distracted by the other's work meetings. The downside for me is that I can no longer see my garden birds while working. But an unexpected upside is that now I have a totally different outlook and I'm seeing bird activity that I never saw before. Almost daily I see red kites flying lazy circles in the sky ahead of me and a couple of days ago I saw two buzzards circling as well, although I'm not sure they'll be sticking around as this is the red kites patch. I keep a small pair of binoculars and my camera at my side because who knows what I might see. A week or so ago I noticed a red kite flying in a more ungainly way than usual. When I got my binoculars on it, I could see it was carrying a large twig. It flew out of sight beyond some tall trees, but surely that was a sign of nest building. Along with the kite, I've seen magpies and a wood pigeon collecting sticks for nests recently. I feel like the breeding season is almost here. Other birds I've seen from my new vantage point are house sparrows and goldfinches in the small tree at the end of my neighbour's drive. The top of the tree is at my eye level, and so it's great for seeing the small birds that stop there. At the end of January, I looked out of my window and noticed a bird in my neighbour's shrub opposite. I thought at first it was one of the house sparrows that are often there, but something didn't look quite right for that species. I picked up my little travel binoculars that were always next to me and saw it was a male black cap eating red berries. That was another species added to my year list without even trying. And in the past couple of days, a red wing has stopped by to eat the red berries in that same shrub, which was wonderful to see. So I mentioned earlier that I'd fixed a window feeder to the outside of my office window. And that was a great move. It took about two and a half weeks for the first bird to find it, a blue tit, first flying near the feeder and hovering to check it out, which progressed to landing, as it does now to pick through which treat to take. I've only filled the front section so that I don't waste food. I originally put out sunflower hearts, shelled peanuts and suet pellets all mixed together, but I noticed it was preferring the nuts, and so I now emphasise roughly chopped almonds, walnuts, hazelnuts and peanuts in the mix. The blue tip visits up to six times during the day, so it's definitely one of its stopping points for food now. I'm delighted to be able to see the bird so closely, and so far it doesn't seem too nervous of me, although I do sit stock still when it arrives. I'm hoping that more species will visit the feeder, but for now I'm happy this blue tit was brave enough to try it. I asked members of the show's community what their birding hopes and plans were for the coming year. Mel has been out and about quite a bit already this year. Hey Susie, it's Mel from at Shepherd Wells, Covid crazy chap on Twitter. Uh, goals for this year, going to try where possible to see as many birds as I can. Going to do the bird watching magazine, My 200 Bird Year. Um, off to a fairly good start, probably on and around 75 species, having seen two water rail today at uh, RSPB Rye Meat. Thanks Susie, catch you soon. Mel posted that at the end of January... His totals were already at 94, so he's well on the way to seeing his 200 bird species in the year. Ewan, the Edinburgh bird watcher, told me, This year is a special year for me because I celebrate 20 years of birding. I'm planning on visiting my usual hotspots that I like to go to, including the Scottish Seabird Centre in North Berwick and a holiday to Benbecula in the Outer Hebrides in late April or early May. Later in the summer, I'm going to Norway and I'm looking forward to seeing the birds there. I'm going to take each day as it comes and make my 20th anniversary year a special one. Congratulations on your 20th year of birding, Ewan, and I look forward to hearing all about your journeys during the year. I'll also be catching up with Ewan in a future episode to find out more about his celebrations and what birding means to him. Hi there, it's Karin from Olu in Finland, thinking about what I want from 2022. Well, I want more of the same, really. Um, I want 
more birding that's going to bring me peace of mind and contact with nature, understanding more a little bit about how birds behave, where to find them, what their kind of jizz is, really. I also want to get much better at IDs, waders, for instance, and little flocks of flying birds twittering away. I've got a life list of 247, so I'd love to get that up to 250. Probably just within Finland. I can't think that I'm going to travel very far. But I'd love to get whiteback woodpecker, avocet, which are pretty elusive here. And some of the bogey birds that I should get, like eagle owl and pygmy owl, but they've eluded me. But I just want it to be an enjoyable, relaxed year and... I hope the same for everybody else in Casual Birder Podcast Land. Thanks very much. Bye for now. Fingers crossed that you make it to 250 species this year, Karin, and that you have lots of beautiful, calming moments surrounded by birds. I was delighted to be asked to speak last week to the Orange Audubon Society in their bird chat series. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to be in Florida with them, but the wonders of the internet meant that I was able to join them online to share my presentation and answer questions afterwards, even though it was after midnight, my time, when the session took place. I shared photos and videos of my day's casual birding in Baja, California, Mexico, mentioned in a previous episode, and I showed what a typical day's birding in the grounds of the Vine, my local stately home in Hampshire, might reveal. The presentation is now on the Orange Audubon Society's YouTube channel, and the link is in the episode notes. Do check out their other videos and talks too. My thanks to Cathy for inviting me to speak and for being so welcoming as the host of the evening. I am available for other events, so if you'd like to invite me to your club to speak, whether in person or virtually, do let me know. I've also loved reading the posts of all the birds that you've seen so far this year. Sean, who lives on the Isle of Rum and is taking part in the local Big Year Challenge, as I mentioned earlier, is currently up to 61 species. He told us of a brief visit he made to the mainland, travelling down to Lancashire by car and back up to Rum by train over just a few days. He said, I didn't have much time for birding, but managed to bump up my year list to 78 species. I had a walk around a reservoir called the Wayo in Lancashire near where I was brought up in fading light and added 14 species to my year list. These were barn owl, carrion crow, coot, golden eye, great crested grebe, house sparrow, jackdaw, magpie, moorhen, rook, shoveller, tawny owl, teal and tufted duck. I left early the next day by train and while waiting at Bolton railway station I heard Eurasian oyster catcher calling in the dark I'm pretty sure a single call of pink-footed geese flying over, although I didn't count this as I wasn't 100% sure. And then I got two more ticks waiting at Dalmuir Railway Station near Glasgow. These were black-headed gull and lesser black-backed gull. And finally, while waiting for the ferry back over to Rum, I got two more year ticks of Ida and collared dove. Thanks for sharing that, Sean. It's amazing how many birds you see when you take notice of what's around you, whatever you're doing, even if you're just waiting at a train station. In our Facebook group, Christopher told us about a few of his wonderful birding moments so far this year. Right at the beginning of January, he saw his first lifer of 2022, three red-breasted megansers seen while out on one of his usual walks down to a local nature reserve at the head of an estuary. He felt it was a good omen for the year. Christopher also posted a photograph of himself, beaming with the associated text, the face of a man who's just seen his first snow bunting. Gorgeous little thing seen on Totley Moor near Sheffield. My second lifer and 54th species of 2022. Lovely plumage and very confiding. I watched it feeding in the grass and preening. I knew where this one individual had been reported recently and realised it was on a bus route, so had to go. I think this counts as twitching. A passing birder confirmed its presence and I was later able to point it out to some others, sharing the joy. I'm lucky it showed so well as it was the only bird I saw on the entire moor. Congratulations on your life for Christopher. It sounds like you had a great opportunity to really study and appreciate it. And how nice of you to point it out to those other people. As you say, sharing the joy. 
Christopher also told us about another bird he saw recently, a white-throated dipper along the shallow Porter Brook in Sheffield, where he lives. The particular sighting he told us about, he said, was excellent. Really good views of this scaly-looking plumage on the bird's back and observations of its feeding behaviour. Encouraging, too, that the dipper seemed to feel so at ease right next to a well-used footpath. He said, today was particularly special and memorable because I heard the bird's delicate and enthralling song over the babble of the stream. It even seemed to practice quietly before committing to its tune. I leant against a tree and listened in awe. The dipper was my 59th species of 2022. The 60th came shortly after in the form of a stock dove, which I managed to confirm thanks to Susie's tip of noting the entirely dark eyes. How wonderful to hear the dipper singing. I love hearing about your birding trips, Christopher, as you take so much joy in every new bird you see. And I'm glad the tip about the eyes helped you out there. Gemma ensured she made the most of January the 1st. She said, First day of 2022, and we saw 45 species of bird, including one lifer, which was the rock pipit. Congratulations on the rock pipit, Gemma, and I hope you've been able to get out to do some more birding sessions since then. Natasha in Shetland said that a change in her working pattern had left her with some extra time in the mornings. On her first day of the new pattern, she planned to celebrate with some pre-work bird watching on the nearby coastline. She said, However, as I arrived into town, it started raining, so I quickly came up with plan B, which was to sit in the cafe about five minutes away and have one of the free coffees I've earned on my loyalty card. The cafe is situated on the waterline, and if you're lucky, you get to see otters. Not so lucky this morning, but as soon as I sat down, I spotted a heron, and during the 20 minutes I was there, as the sky slowly lightened, I saw oyster catcher, red knot, purple sandpiper, ruddy turnstones, and some gulls. Natasha, thanks for sharing how you were able to squeeze some more birding into your day. Andrew Kelly said, just back from a weekend on the Wirral, visiting family, orienteering and birding. Spent a couple of hours watching the marshes at Parkgate and Neston, with, for me, spectacular results, given the short space of time we were there. No photos. It was a dull day and most views too distant to really pay off, but loads of brilliant sightings. Main stars were, of course, the pink-footed geese, with hundreds of them in and out all the time, constantly wink-winking. Individual star attraction had to be the hunting short-eared owl that I watched for a quarter of an hour from Denhaw Quay. Glorious. Other species included marsh harrier, hen harrier, kestrel, two females nice and close up, including watching demolition of mouse prey, buzzard, great white and little egret, black-tailed godwit, shoveler, teal, great black-backed gull, skylark and others. Definitely recommended. I'm certainly going back for a better explore, The year count shot up to 67. By the way, my local list now stands at 54. I've decided to make this a longer term thing for me. Narrowed it down a bit, it basically now covers just my local parish plus two adjacent ones either side, covering a section of Wharfdale, with some really interestingly varied habitats. Means leaving out one or two excellent sites that are a few kilometres away, less than eight, but I just don't count them as local if I'm really honest. And there's always my Wharfdale list. Hearing about Andrew's weekend away started me thinking. How interesting it would be to hear about different birding locations and what we might see there. I've got a few episodes lined up with some guest speakers, so do look out for those starting in the coming weeks, and maybe it will give you ideas of places you might like to visit. On the subject of episode content, a quick reminder that my survey is still open if you'd like to have a say in the topics or guests included on the show. It should only take a few minutes to complete and your answers will have a real impact on the podcast. You can also leave me feedback on what you like about the show or what you'd like to see done differently. You can find the survey at bit.ly forward slash CBP content survey or one word. The link is in the episode notes and the survey will be open until the end of February. I really do want to hear your views, so please do take part. The first big birding event of the UK calendar just passed, the Big Garden Bird Watch. Lots of us took part and we'll be waiting to see what the results from the RSPB are on what the top birds were that were seen this year. In my bird watch, I saw eight species, mostly just one of each species, 
although I had 12 wood pigeons and four rooks during the period that I watched. Ewan had to put off his bird watch until the following day because of storms. He saw nine wood pigeon, 12 blackbirds, goldfinch, chaffinch, greenfinch, house sparrow, magpie, robin, blue tit, great tit and dunnock. Owen saw 13 species in total, with a song thrush as a nice bonus. He also had black cap, long-tailed tit and goldfinch in amongst the birds seen. Karin took part out in Finland. It was minus five there, so a warm day, she says, but with fresh snow. Karin had a well-stocked bird table out and it was relatively ignored. She saw three great tits, two blue tits, a tree sparrow and a green finch, which was um, not bad considering the, the poor conditions. But hopefully more birds have visited since then. And of course, it is just a snapshot of the birds that are in your garden at that particular time. You always want it to be like all your most favourite species turn up but you can't know what's going to be there. And sometimes I've had just one species turn up. In fact, sometimes I've had no species turn up. We've also just had the Great Backyard Bird Count, which, although it started off as a North American survey, is now open to anyone in the world to take part. Unfortunately, we've had really stormy weather over the last few days, and I had to work. So I just did a count from my office window. But if you took part, do let me know what you saw. Other events coming up. In March, it's the March Equinox Birding event. Now, this is just a fun event that I've started doing along with listeners for the show for the equinoxes and the solstices each year. So the idea is that you bird for as long as you want, actually on the solstice or the equinox if you can, or a couple of days either side if there's a weekend that's more convenient. Bird for at least 15 minutes and list the birds you see. Share your checklist with eBird because if we're doing this, we might as well help contribute to the community science. Share your favourite sightings with our community, whether that's as part of our Facebook group or with me on Twitter or Instagram. I'll tell you about it as we get closer to the event, but I'd love you to take part because I want to hear about what birds you're seeing wherever you are in the world. On Sunday, May the 1st, 2022, it's International Dawn Chorus Day. Join us and get up early and hear the birds singing out to attract their mates and mark their territories. As we approach the date, those of us living in the Northern Hemisphere will notice more and more bird song in the mornings. Even if you live in urban areas, there's likely to be blackbirds or robins singing out. What I've done in previous years, and I hope to do this year too, is join an early morning bird walk with a local, either an RSPB group or some other birders. It's such an uplifting time of year. On the 14th of May, it's the Global Big Day. And once again, I'll be putting together an international team to take part. So look out for that. And I hope you'll join our team. It will be a virtual team, but I hope sometime I'll be able to do an in-person team event. But it's an opportunity to see birds, feel part of an international team, and hopefully raise money for BirdLife International along the way. The Global Bird Fair is taking place the 15th to the 17th of July 2022 in Rutland in the UK. I'll be there for all three days and if you're going to be attending, do let me know because it would be lovely to meet up. I hope you're enjoying all the birds that you're seeing. And don't forget, I love to hear about them. If you have any favourite bird reserves that you visit or special birding locations that you'd like to tell me about, go to the contact page on my website, casualbirder.com, and you can leave me a voice or a written message. And maybe we can get you on the show to tell us about it. I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you to Randy Braun for designing the artwork for the show. The theme music is Short Sleeve Shirt by The Drones. Thanks to them for letting me use it. Check out their website at dronesmusic.net. Thank you all for listening, and I hope you'll join me again for another episode of the Casual Birder podcast. (laughs) 